So my name is Erling Norby and I've trained to be a virologist and I've have taught about viruses at the medical school, but also have overriding administrative responsibilities both at the Karolinska Institute, the School of Medicine in Stockholm, and at the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences in Stockholm. And the story I'm going to tell you about is the discovery of the structure of DNA. And to those of you in the audience who may be a little younger would think that but the structure of DNA must have been known forever, but that is not so. So there was a true discovery of its structure. And as a consequence of that, one also started to understand the enormous impact that this molecule had. Before this discovery, it was not known. In fact, there was a considerable debate on the, the relative role of proteins versus nucleic acid. And the emphasis was on the proteins because the proteins had much more diversity, 20 amino acids that could be varied in different forms. Whereas the DNA was a rather boring molecule with just the four nucleotides. And uh, there were also some incorrect data suggesting that they were, uh, the, the relative representation of the four bases was rather constant in different types of kinds of DNA. So how was this, this discovery made? Well, what happened was that in the 1940s, uh, the development of the, the field of physics had been very, very powerful. And physicists thought that they might have something to contribute to the field of, of biology. So a lot of physicists trained uh, to understand the, the major questions in biology at the time, and they started to study biological phenomena. In England, the Medical Research Council decided to really invest in it and stimulate physicists to study biological phenomena. And there were two centra that were established. One was at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. And that was managed by Lawrence Bragg. He became the head of that institution in uh, the end 1930s. And the other uh, was at King's College in London. And uh, he, uh, the, the, the person who was responsible there was John Randall, who had, uh, during the war, made very important, he was a physicist, made very important, important contributions to the uh, development of the radar that was very critical in deciding the outcome of the Second World War. But the, the, there was kind of gentleman agreements between these two different uh, laboratories and also in a, uh, supported them by the Medical Research Council, namely that in Cambridge one should study protein structures and that King's College one could study other structures including nucleic acids. And the two leading figures at the Cavendish Laboratory was Max Perrault and John Kendrew. They were crystallographers who uh, uh, really embarked on an almost impossible project, namely to study very huge molecules that, uh, with a complexity that one predicted, given it, it, it could not be done. But they started this in the end 30s, and then they um, developed this te technique step by step way into the 1950s. And then later in the 50s came much, much better computers. And uh, that should be emphasized that the possibility of, of processing a huge amount of information helped in this, this uh, analysis. And eventually one managed to define the three-dimensional structure of very complex protein structures like hemoglobin and myoglobin. So that was the protein studies. But uh, at the King's College, uh, there were uh, a person called Morris Wilkins, who had joined uh, Randall already before he came to King's College at, at St. Andrews in Scotland. And he was trying to study nucleic acids. In January 1951, he was joined by a female scientist by the name of Rosalind Franklin, who came from uh, France, where she had studied uh, inorganic uh, carbon compounds. She had very little knowledge about biology, and she was given this task to, to help or to, to uh, study DNA. And, and she thought that the mission was to do that on her own responsibility. Wilkins thought that it would do the collaboration, but they never developed a collaboration with this, these two persons. And uh, there was a, a, very, a very special stories about uh, how uh, they, each one of them, 
try to, to approach this problem. What really sort of perturbed the whole thing was when in uh, the autumn of 1950, Jim Watson came to Cambridge. It's a long story why he ended up there, because he was in a scholarship in Denmark, he was satisfied with that, and he had this idea that he thought that DNA had something to do with the genetic material, and a little obsessed by that. And then he, uh, he was in, in 1950, he was in Naples and heard a lecture by Wilkins about the attempts to study the, the structure of DNA by, by crystallographic analysis. And that further uh, uh, convinced him that, that this was the thing to do. Uh, but he was not satisfied with his time in, in Denmark, so uh, he, by some help from, from his mentors, he could move to, to uh, the Cavendish laboratory. And who did he meet there? He met Francis Crick. Francis Crick was about 12 years older than what Jim Watson was. But the two of them really formed a remarkable couple, and they stimulated each other. And even though, I mean, the Cavendish laboratory was supposed to work on proteins, then uh, these two uh, gentlemen couldn't refrain from discussing nucleic acid and the possible structure of that. And they even made a, a little model of that which told, that was then uh, described to them to be completely wrong. They had a triple helix, they had a, a basic extending to the periphery, and uh, it was heavily criticized because clearly it was, was wrong. Uh, and then Bragg decided that, that they were not allowed to work on nucleic acids. But uh, one can see in the documents that there are, that they kept on thinking about that. They met Shargraf, the famous person who had, had a, already at this time says that the amount of, of the nucleotides A and T and G and C are that they are uh, in equal proportion in each of these pairs. And no one would fully understand why, why this was important. So anyhow, the uh, Watson and Crick, uh, they were not allowed to, to work on, on the, the nucleic acid. But then things started to happen, because Linus Pauling had had a fantastic advance. He, he was the, the giant in chemistry of his time, and he got a Nobel Prize in 54 for his studies of the chemical bond. But all at that time, he had a pioneering contribution in the terms of the structure of proteins, and in particular, the occurrence of something like an alpha helix. And that was a little to the chagrin of the, the Cavendish group, because they would have liked to be ahead of Pauling, but he was that. And then Pauling says that decided, no, I'm going to go for the Holy Grail. I want to study the structure of DNA. And this rumor started to spread, of course, in the autumn of 1952, uh, uh, it was. And then uh, Linus Pauling's son, Peter Pauling, was in, at the Cavendish laboratory. And so he received all the information from his father. And in around December uh, 1952, there was a manuscript from Pauling. Uh, about the structure of DNA. And of course, Watson and Crick got all very, very concerned because, okay, so, so maybe Paul had really solved the structure. And they started to look at this manuscript to the big surprise. They found that this giant in chem chemistry had made some major, major mistakes. In fact, the model he proposed was very similar to the model that Watson and Crick had proposed a year before. It's been demonstrated to them to be uh, all wrong. This then led to that Bragg said, and, and because I mean, scientists are competitive, and, and he wouldn't like to see uh, Pauling uh, coming ahead in this field. So he said to Watson Craig, OK, you can work on DNA. And that was about Christmas time in 1952. Then there were three facts that added to this very intense development January and February 1953, and one can almost follow it from a minute to minute. So what were, were these things? Well, uh, Rosalind Franklin had, had clarified that there were two forms of, of DNA, and both of them could crystallize, but the B form was a little, little wetter, that's more water, didn't crystallize as well. Uh, so she was mostly concerned with the A form. But we, she didn't understand that they were two forms of the same molecule. And if she had really uh, decided to work on uh, the, the B form, uh, she might have made even better headway than what, what she did. But, but she did receive very important data. The, Watson and Crick knew about this because Peru 
who was on the review committee to look at the data from King's College leaked the information that was in the report from December 1952. And that been very much discussed. And Perus himself has said that, well, I was a little immature and I didn't, I mean, it wasn't secret material, so I shared it. But the other thing was something that happened, uh, and that was in January, because then Watson was visiting King's College, and then he was shown this picture. And it's been taken by Rosalind Franklin and her collaborator Gosling, as is on, uh, named on, on this. And it's a very, very special uh, picture. And when Watson saw this, and he, he received this information via Wilkins, he immediately understood, wait a moment, this must be a double helix. And of course, Crick, who was the one who really knew structure, could, could really support that and conclude that it was, must have been double helix with the two helices running in opposite direction. Here is a point in history where we're never going to know the truth. Because it says in many books that, that this picture was taken from Rosalind Franklin without her knowledge. And the family still believe that that is the case. But you have the other side of the version where it says in the annotated uh, book of the double helix where it says that, that uh, Franklin gave this picture to Wilkins as a gift and he could use it. Personally, I think the truth is somewhere in between these two. I don't think that it uh, was really stolen from Franklin. If that had been the case, she would have been much ups more upset. And she was a person with considerable temperament. And later on, this picture, 51, has been used to illustrate the structure of DNA and used by Crick in reviews. There's even a play that's called Photograph 51 that really describes the fascinating life of Rosalind Franklin. And I might as well mention that already here. She uh, was, worked on DNA for 27 months. Then she left and started to study viruses, did some major contributions to a study of virus structures. I really pioneered that work. And then in 1956, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and she died in 1958. She was never nominated for a Nobel Prize. But she was clearly a, a person who could have been a very strong candidate for that. So this photograph fit one one. But, but the, the third thing that was very, very crucial was that in order to make the model build, the building of, of models, uh, Watson had uh, cut out uh, the different uh, nucleotides. And he has used Davidson's textbook, which everyone was using. That is the, the chemistry of, of its time. And then there was another person, again, in, in the same room where they were at Cavendish, Jerry Dono, also in California, in fact, like Peter Pauli. And Jerry Dono, for some reason, said that I didn't think you should use the structure that is there in Davidson's textbook. You should use the other former bases. And I can just say, Watson said, oh, are the two former bases? I mean, he didn't know much of chemistry. You know? But he decided not to use the enol form, uh, but upon the advice of Jerry Dunn, he used the keto form. And that was what really solved the whole thing, because then one could build the final model. And that's how it all converged. And the final model was the really, uh, or the, the final, uh, let's say, the identification of the structure was in the morning of February 28, 1953. And here's a few days later with Watson and Crick uh, in a very famous picture illustrating what the model looks like. And once one had this model, everything became very clear. Because here was a beautiful, simple molecule that when it replicated, retained the same uh, structure in this semi-conservative replication. It also had this basis that could come in any order and therefore could represent a information carrying uh, a device. And of course, very soon after this, one started to study what, what could a genetic language be. And since there are four bases and there are uh, 20 amino acids, clearly it was not enough to have just pairs of, of of, of bases because that will not suffice for all the amino acids. So there must be triplets and then progressively one could uh, interpret the, the, the language that nature has used ever since life started to develop in this, uh, as DNA designed life has started to develop in this world some 
eight billion years ago. So the impact was absolutely enormous. And the story goes, of course, that, that on that February 28th, Watson and Crick went down to that. The, the pub which they used to visit after the day's work and said, we have found the molecule of life. It probably is a good story. No one has managed to substantiate that. And, and one, one, for example, one has interviewed Odile Crick and while she was still alive and asked her, was there something special on that February 28th? And she said, well, normally when, when, when Crick came home, there was always some wild story about the great discovery that he had made because he was this almost hypermaniac person. But on this day, he had some very good reasons to be that. So here is Watson receiving the prize in 1962 from the hands of His Majesty the King. And uh, he was the third youngest Nobel laureate in physiology or medicine, the youngest being uh, Friedrich Benting and then uh, Josh Lederberg were also uh, younger than Watson, they're 32 and 33 years each. But Watson was 34 years old. And having the privilege of a long, rich life, he could come back and collect uh, and discuss what's happened with it. But before that, perhaps, let me uh, uh, illustrate that, that I, I've tried in introducing different chapters in this book that I have just recently published by a small uh, haikus. And the haiku that relate to the chapter that discusses DNA simply reads, the double helix, eternity in a string, symmetry well used. And uh, I want to emphasize the eternity because this is the language that's been used ever since uh, the genetic language was, was invented at the, or when the life really originated in the world. 